Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Thank you for coming to church when the preacher's out of town. I appreciate it. Uh, I know a lot of people are traveling. Uh, For those of you that may be new with us, um, there's a card in front of you. If you want to fill that out and take it to the back after service, uh, we have a gift for you. We'd love to get some information and connect with you. And uh, just so you know, we have uh, about 30 people, give or take a few, I think. It's a little more than 30 who uh, have spent the last week in New York on a missions trip. So they're traveling back just uh, if you're confused by that. Um, so that's why we're a little scarce. Uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our congregation is traveling. A lot of other people were at the beach. Um, I just got back from the beach yesterday. And uh, I have the wonderful privilege of, I think, closing out this refresh series completely refreshed right because I spent a week at the beach um I'll tell you there were a few things that were very refreshing about our vacation and there were some things that that weren't so refreshing uh have any of you ever seen anybody skimboard anybody yeah well okay so (laughs) there was a family beside us on the beach one day and there was like a little kid I mean maybe 10 12 years old and he was just making it look easy. He was just gliding along. He, he'd even like sit down on it and ride. And I was like, I can do that. And uh, Ashley's mom bought her little cousin one. And, and I tried it. And, and it didn't end so well. Uh, so I, I fell down a lot. So I was like, maybe it's because I'm heavier than him. And, you know, he had a better board. So I went and bought one that was bigger. And it didn't help at all. Uh, so unfortunately... I I still can't skimboard, and I have some bumps and bruises, and even worse than that, Ashley's family has some blackmail videos of of me falling. Uh, But for the most part, the trip was very refreshing. Uh, It was great to get away for a little while and just kind of hang out with family. Um, I wish... I wish that we didn't need this series. I wish that all of us continually felt refreshed, stayed refreshed. Uh, But the reality is... Uh, we get tired, uh, we get worn out, and, and sometimes we need to, to step away and, and allow God to refresh us. And uh, Charlie's been doing an awesome job, I think, of, of, of speaking on this idea of, of how we refresh our soul. And I want to continue that this morning. Um, but first of all, let me ask, how many of you uh, have been in one of those places where you're just like, I'm done, I just want to give up, I just want to crawl in a hole, and be left alone. Anybody? Uh, I feel that way a lot, especially dealing with teenagers so much. Uh, I just want to go hide from them sometimes. Uh, But uh, we all have those times where we're just worn out. And a lot of times, physical exhaustion is followed by spiritual exhaustion. And when we allow ourselves to physically get worn down, uh, our our spiritual, our soul kind of follows. And and we just get worn out spiritually too. Uh, So I want to talk to you this morning about one of my favorite stories. And uh, we're going to start off in 1 Kings, if you want to go ahead and turn there. And in chapter 18, we have the showdown. Uh, We're talking about Elijah here. And Elijah was like a superhero in the Old Testament, right? He was was like, uh, of all the prophets, he was like on the varsity team. You know, he was a starter. Uh, He did some amazing things, some incredible things. And uh, there are some awesome stories about Elijah's life. And um, in 1 first first Kings 18, uh, we start out with Elijah going, and, well, actually before this, um, Elijah ha- has gone to the king, and the king, his name's Ahab, and he's done a lot of things that God didn't like. He's been very disobedient. He even married a woman who wasn't one of God's people, and she brought in Baal worship and idol worship into the community of God's people. And um, this, this king was just, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't believe in God. He didn't trust God. He went his own way. And uh, Elijah goes up to this king and basically says, um, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to. It's not going to rain. There's not even going to be any dew on the ground until I say the word, until God tells me that he's going to bring rain. So what I think is really cool about this is, is, is Elijah's boldness. In my reading, I learned uh, that Baal was considered like the water god. 
So think of how bold this is to go and say, I know you, you worship the God of, of water and rain, but I'm telling you it's not going to rain until I say it's going to. So it's like a, a punch in the face of this other God. It's so bold. I love Elijah's boldness and trust in the Lord to go and, and just proclaim this to the king. So uh, we fast forward three years, and, the, and, and in chapter 18 it starts. No rain for three years, and Elijah uh, is told by the Lord, go and present yourself to Ahab. And uh, so Elijah goes, he meets Obadiah on the way, who's another prophet who works for the king. And, and Obadiah goes and tells King Ahab that he found him. Uh, Ahab comes out, and, and basically Elijah sets up this big showdown. He says, you bring the 450 prophets of Baal, you bring all the prophets of Asherah, you bring all your, your people that worship your gods, and you invite all the people out here. And, and each one of us is going to make a sacrifice. And the God who answers with fire, he's the real God. So all of Israel comes out. You know, they bring their popcorn. Uh, they, they come to watch this showdown. And another bold statement. Elijah stands up in front of everybody and says, How long will you waver between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. But if Baal is God, serve him. And basically today we're going to find out which one really is God. So uh, Elijah's bold. He's brave. He, he stands with authority from the Lord. And uh, so basically, not only this, but he gives up home field advantage. He says, y'all go first. Y'all pick whichever animal you want for sacrifice. I'll take the leftover. I'll take whichever one you don't choose. And y'all can go first. And there's 450 of you. There's only one of me. Let's see what happens. So uh, the, the prophets of Baal start preparing the sacrifice. They put it on the altar and, and they start praying for, for Baal to send fire. And, and it's not working. Nothing's happening. And, you know, so they, they scream louder. They start jumping around and Elijah starts taunting them. You see the boldness again. He says, maybe, maybe you're not yelling loud enough. Maybe... Maybe he's just busy. Maybe he's deep in thought and he doesn't hear you. And, and it goes on and, and, and it, it gets to the point where Elijah's like, maybe he's using the bathroom. Maybe you just need to give him a few minutes. And, and these people are, are, are going crazy. They're, they're cutting themselves. They're doing things. They're, they're doing everything they possibly can to get their God to answer. But nothing happens. So... Even, even after that, even giving them home field advantage, everything, uh, Elijah says, get a bunch of water. And three times he covers the altar in water. So the sacrifice is wet, the wood's wet, the rocks are wet, the area around it's wet. In, in the point, he says to dig a trench around it, and that fills up with water. He puts himself at a complete disadvantage. And then he prays, and, and God's fire comes down. And it consumes the sacrifice, it consumes the wood, it consumes the stones and laps up the water around it. How many of you have seen a fire hot enough to burn a stone? How about instantly? Okay, this was powerful stuff and Elijah is the one that facilitated it. It's incredible, right? So there, there's no question who wins this fight. There's no question who's the victor in this. And Elijah tells people to seize the prophets of Baal and all those other people, and they kill him. Huge victory for God, right? And then Ahab, seeing this, can't deny what just happened. And Elijah goes and he prays for rain. And uh, after he sends a servant away to check seven times, a rain cloud starts forming. So they all go back to Jezreel, where they're from, and the rain starts. And this is where we're going to pick up in the story, right? So that's, that's chapter 18. So um, uh, I want you to remember in this how bold Elijah was, how powerful this, this victory was. And then we go to chapter 19. Uh, it's going to be up on the screen. You can turn there if you want to. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, 
he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the, br- under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. How many of you have had a meal that would sustain you for 40 days and 40 nights? I'm pretty sure it had to be steak or something like that. Um, We'll continue on. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied. Uh, He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. This is the same mountain where Moses experienced God too, where, where, where God passed by Moses and gave him uh, the, uh, the Ten Commandments. I lost my place now. Okay. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Heziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Okay, so what you think would happen after a huge victory is that Elijah would stand bold, right? But what we see here is completely different. We see him running away afraid. So, so I had to ask, what would cause this bold prophet of God to make this change and run away and hide? Uh, to, to give up and say, I just want to die. I'm done, Lord. Um, and and, and what, I, what I come to is, is the fact that in chapter 18, I think Elijah had expectations that this would be the end of the battle, Right? Uh, this, would, this would be the point where after seeing fire come down from heaven and consume everything, how could the people not turn to God? But then Jezebel, uh, the wife of the king who had turned his heart away, responded in anger towards Elijah. Instead of repenting, instead of changing her ways, she decides to take out her anger on him. So I think uh, a lot of times we get to a point, even in being obedient to God, where uh, the, the ending doesn't actually represent what we thought would happen. How it turns out doesn't meet our expectations, and we get frustrated. And, and I think that's what happens here. And I would love to say that my life usually turned out like chapter 18, where I stood boldly, where uh, I made good decisions, where, um, you know, God is glorified through my actions. But a lot of times I find myself in chapter 19 rather than chapter 18. And, and I hope maybe I'm not the only one uh, because misery loves company, right? A lot of times I let my doubts, I let my fears, I let uh, my expectations sometimes get the best of me. And I end up exhausted, I end up frustrated. And I've realized in the past a uh, year or so that it's it's led me into not only discouragement but sometimes depression and um, so I started reading about Elijah because people called him the depressed prophet and I was like 
well, well, maybe I can learn something from him. And uh, we see in this, like, Elijah is depressed. He's frustrated. Um, and what, what I see that led up to that is three years of exhaustion. Um, when, when the rest of Israel suffered from famine, from drought, Elijah did too. Like, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't safe from the suffering because he was God's prophet. God provided for him, but he still had to deal with the situation. And uh, I think a lot of times um, the church kind of turns a blind eye towards that discouragement that leads to depression. And, and I wanted to talk about this morning. I don't know. Uh, I don't want you to, to feel like I've never dealt with depression, so uh, uh, this isn't for me because we've all dealt with discouragement, but I think for some of us, it goes deeper. And I'm an overanalyzing person, so when I get discouraged, it tends to be a downward spiral until I'm just in a place where I am useless to everybody. And so I can relate to Elijah here. Um, I, I can relate to being to the point where he's like, I'm done. I give up. I've had enough. And um, I think there are a lot of things we can learn from this situation. Uh, the first thing is, um, God, God comes to Elijah and he says, what are you doing here? And that seems so simple, but he asked it twice. So I started looking and every other time, God told Elijah where to go. Um, you know, he told him to go to the king and, and tell him there's no water. And then after that, he sends him into this ravine. And it says, ravens bring him food. So, so birds bring this guy food. And there's water there. There's a spring. And as the spring dries up, he, he sends him to another area. And that's where we get the story of Elijah and the widow, where the widow, he, he encounters her and she says, I've only got enough bread and oil uh, to make a little bread for me and my son, and then we're going to die. And Elijah's like, feed me first. And your, your oil and flour will never run out. And we see this provision there. And, and then it says, Elijah, it's time to go back to Ahab. It's time to present yourself. But the fact that, that, that God says, what are you doing here? Means this isn't where he wanted Elijah to be. This isn't where he sent Elijah. Elijah goes here on his own. And don't get me, don't, don't think for a moment that God didn't know what Elijah was doing there. He knew, but he asked the question because I think he wants Elijah to think about it. So everywhere else Elijah had gone, he had followed the Lord's direction. And uh, I, I just, I was thinking about things that, that this passage reveals about discouragement and about depression. And uh, the, the first thing is that it makes you look inward. Uh, it makes you look at yourself. Uh, we, we talk here about being the church. We talk about going out and serving people. Uh, well, what depression uh, does in a lot of ways is you start saying, well, nobody's doing that for me. Why should I do it for someone else? And, and we start looking inward and, and we kind of start having a pity party and we start thinking about ourselves uh, instead of other people and then our perspective just narrows and all we can see is our frustrations, our unhappiness, our doubts, our wants that aren't being taken care of. So it makes you look inward. Uh, the second thing it does is it makes you believe lies. And uh, I found this interesting too. Uh, when, when God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? Uh, Elijah goes on this rant and he says it twice. You know, this is a memorized thing. He's thought about it. So this is his anger towards the Lord. He says, you know, uh, they've done this, they've done this, they've done this. And he said, I'm the only one left. Well, if we look at the chapter before, we know Obadiah is still there, right? So he's not alone. And Obadiah tells him, I've hit a hundred people. So if there are a hundred people that Obadiah has hidden away, plus Obadiah, that's 101 people. So why does Elijah feel alone unless he's believing a lie? Right? He's not the only one, but what discouragement does is once again draws your focus in and all you can see is yourself. So he feels completely alone. And, and, and that's one weird thing about depression and stuff is you can feel completely alone in a crowd of people. 
uh, it's not rational. It's not normal. And, and, and please don't think I have any qualification to speak on depression. I'm just talking about my experiences and what this uh, story reveals. Uh, but hopefully my experiences can help somebody. Uh, the next thing it does is it drives Elijah into isolation. He gets away from everybody. Even his servant, who's probably the closest peer person to him, he travels with him. This is like family to him. He leaves him behind and goes out in the desert. And he just wants to die. Uh, it drives him into isolation. It makes you want to give up. And uh, it, it makes you want to avoid any more discouragement, any more pain, anything like that. It just drives you away from that. And uh, the, the next thing I want you to see in this is God's design wasn't for Elijah to go off alone. We see that in him asking, what are you doing here? Uh, Elijah may be here, but it wasn't obedience to the Lord that led him to discouragement. It was his expectations. He basically expected God to act one way and do things one way, and God did something different. And I think we do that a lot. We say, God, if you could answer this request, and this is how I want to answer it, and if you could do that by 5 o'clock tomorrow, it would be awesome. And you guys know that's not exactly how God works. Um, so many times, and, and look, at, look at Scripture. Uh, God's people missed the Messiah coming because of their expectations. And I think a lot of times our expectations are our biggest enemy. Uh, many times we, we miss a lot because we're expecting something else. Um, so... So those are some things that discouragement and depression do. They make us look inward. They make us believe lies. They make us feel alone, drive us into isolation, and uh, make us want to, to go to the point where we just want to give up. And now let's look at how God responds to that. Um, first of all, all along this, God has provided all the way. I mean, when he was in the valley, birds carried him food. There was, there was water available from a, a spring, but birds brought him food. I've never had a bird bring me food. So this is God's hand. This is supernatural. Birds don't naturally bring people food. I don't think. Uh, I've never experienced it. Uh, the seagulls on the beach, they never bring you food. They just take yours. Um, but God provides food. We see that. We see him go to the widow, and, and they're provided for. And then... Uh, even when he runs away, even when he's outside of where God told him to be, God's still providing. He wakes up, an angel wakes him up, and there's bread and water there at his head. Now, the trouble once again comes in when we look at the bread and we say, well, I really wanted a hamburger, God. Uh, but, but, but many times, in God's provision, we complain because it's not what we wanted. But the provisions there, his needs were met all along the way. Um, the second thing God does uh, for Elijah is he breaks through those lies. And, and, and Elijah says twice, I'm completely alone. I'm the only one left. And God's like, there are 7,000 other people that haven't bowed to Baal, that haven't kissed him. You're not alone. And I think that is a very comforting message when you feel completely alone. Uh, and maybe you're in a struggle that you feel like no one else can relate to. Maybe you're in a place in your life where you're like, I'm completely alone in this. And I just want to comfort you by saying you're not. Uh, there are people in the same situations you are. Maybe the details are different, but they're feeling the same way. And there are other people who have been in that situation and lived through it. And then there are just other people who just love you and want to encourage you and care for you. And, and I, want, uh, I want that to break through. I want God to penetrate your heart if you're feeling completely alone to know you aren't. Uh, one reason I know that is you're sitting in this church and I know the love that this church has for people. Uh, so if you don't want to be alone, uh, this is a place that you can come. Uh, so so God, God provides for him. He breaks through the lies and assures Elijah. And the third thing he does is he gives Elijah a purpose because Elijah had lost his. And, and, and maybe you kind of miss that when you're looking through. But he says, 
you're looking inward, you're looking at yourself, you feel like you're the only one, I'm giving you Elisha. And you're going to be a mentor. So he takes that person that's looking inward and forces him outward, right? He forces him to look at another person. He, he forces him to pour into another person. And um, I think many times that's why books like Purpose Driven Life are so popular. It's because sometimes we forget we have a purpose. Uh, sometimes it gets lost in the busyness and things like that. Um, and, and we need to be reminded that we have a purpose. We need purpose clearly defined for us. And that's what God does here for Elijah. And um, as we continue on, I think there's one other thing here that, that ties all three of those things together. The provision, uh, the, the breaking through the lies, and uh, the, the making him serve, the giving him a purpose. Um, because you can do all those things without God. You can find a purpose and pour yourself into it. Uh, you can find ways uh, of provision and, and you can kind of break through some lies yourself if you're willing. But I think this kind of ties it all together. And um, as, as we look in how God showed up in chapter 19, um, let me just read it again. And it says... Um, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains, uh, tore the mountains apart, and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out stood at the mouth of the cave then a voice said to him what are you doing here Elijah so I've read through that passage so many times but for some reason when, when I was looking at this it hit me like there was wind there was wind that was powerful enough once again to shatter rock that's, that's crazy that's crazy powerful but it says God wasn't in the wind and it says uh, there, there was this earthquake, so the earth was shaking, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then it said there was a fire, but God wasn't in the fire. Where was God? In a gentle whisper. So I started asking myself, what, what usually causes people to whisper? What are the reasons that, that people normally whisper? And, uh, looking at this passage I think the first thing is you don't want someone else to hear what's going on right so you whisper to that person that's how we communicate in church right we whisper to each other um but but this doesn't make sense because they're on a mountain all alone and you know that that doesn't make sense that God would whisper so someone else wouldn't hear because they're the only ones there uh the second thing is fright I think sometimes we get scared and we think that whispering might protect us for some reason but once again this is the God that had wind powerful enough to shatter rocks there was an earthquake there was a fire I don't think he's afraid of much so so that is also discounted it doesn't make sense and, and I'm not I'm not saying uh, I, I'm not a biblical scholar by any means but looking at this and trying to think what could the reason be what could the reason be? It's because he's close. He's close to Elijah. He's close. And I think it's not meant because he's afraid. It's not meant because he doesn't want someone else to hear. It's a sign of intimacy. It's a sign of closeness. And as, as I look at my life in, in the places uh, where I've just said, God, I give up. God, I don't want to have anything else to do with this. It's too exhausting. I'm not strong enough. In places like that, what I long for is the big stuff. What I long for is chapter 18, where God comes and crushes the walls and fixes all my problems. But guess what? No matter how many times that happens, I still have fears. I still have doubts. I still have questions. 
and I still have exhaustion that doesn't go away. So what I wanted God to do is not sufficient. But what God does is he comes close. And he draws near to us in those times. And any, any walls that are built, uh, you know, I, I know I build walls. I build walls to protect myself. I build walls to keep people at a distance. And I hate the walls because once you build them, they kind of trap you in. And that's kind of how depression works, right? And I want God to come and I want him to do something big and shatter those walls. Because I don't have the strength myself to take them down. And uh, he doesn't do that. He comes and sits with us. He doesn't rebuke Elijah for running away. He doesn't say, why didn't you trust me? He doesn't say, didn't you see what I just did? He comes in and he whispers to Elijah and he asks him, what are you doing here? Once again, he knew what he was doing there. And I think... um, I always wanted those spiritual victories uh, to make the doubts go away. I always wanted those spiritual victories to take away the questions, the fears of believing. Because guess what? It's really difficult to believe in God sometimes. When you, when you look at the world, it's hard, for me at least, to not have doubts, to not have questions. But God is bigger than those doubts and God is bigger than those questions. So he just comes and whispers. And um, the beautiful thing is that same God that comes with fire also comes in that whisper. And and the thing about intimacy, uh, it's kind of a weird word. You know, we don't use it very often because I think we're afraid of it. Um. And, and I've heard uh, to be fully known is to be fully loved. And here's the problem. We, we always have this part of us that uh, no other human can know. No human can know my thought life. So there's always this fraction of my life that no one else can know. And there are always these questions, these lies, these doubts that come in that say, well, if they really knew who you were, they wouldn't love you anymore. If they knew what went through your mind, they wouldn't love you anymore. And you always have that question with people, right? You always have that question, is this love unconditional? No matter what the relationship, they can never fully know you. But intimacy with God is different because he can fully know you. And and there are so many things. I appreciate Elijah's honesty because a lot of times I even try to hide it from God. And I try to put on this tough face. And Elijah just says, I'm done. I just want to die. And, you know, then, then, then the Lord comes and speaks to him. And he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Everybody's given up. There's no one faithful. I'm the only one left. Like, it's bold to say to God, especially a God that you just saw do such powerful things. And sometimes I feel like even with God, I pretend everything's okay when it's not. And I ignore it. And once again, I I hope that God comes in and just fixes everything. Uh, But it's when I'm truly honest. When when I when I let go and let everything go before God, when I give him all my doubts, when I say, This is how I'm feeling. It's not good. I'm not in a good place. It's, it's in those moments where I experience that intimacy because he still loves me. And maybe that's what somebody needs to hear this morning is that no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad you think you are, no matter how bad your situation is, God still comes and whispers. God still desires that intimacy. And it's our choice. We can hide behind our walls because God's not going to force us out of them. God never forces us to do anything. But he wants us desperately to choose the hope that is in intimacy with him. So, uh, you know, I don't know how to close these things. Um, I I don't, I'm not the best at this. Um, 
But I do know by statistics that I'm probably not the only one in here that's dealt with depression. And I absolutely know I'm not the only one in here that deals with discouragement. And like I said, we want the big victories. We want the powerful show of God's work. But that only changes us for a while. I look at youth camps and things like that. Revivals. We get on a high for a little while and then it fades because we forget about that. Because our current situation seems bigger to us than what God did in the past. But in those moments, what we need is just intimacy with God. Uh, But God can't bless who you pretend to be. God can't fix problems you ignore. So we have to get to a point where we say, God, this is who I am. It's just me and you. And when we do that, we're not met with rejection. We're met with unconditional love and intimacy. And that's what I want for you guys this morning. So uh, as Andy and them play, we're just going to sing a simple song of worship. And uh, if you need to pray, this is always open. There's nothing special about this place. But maybe that step forward will be a step in tearing down some wall in your life. And... uh, God can meet you wherever you are. If you want to pray where you are, um, just do that. But I encourage you to allow God inside of those walls because he's not going to force his way in. And and those those same walls that you feel like protect you can keep God at a distance. And uh, I just want you guys to know that there's freedom and being fully loved. And uh, I want you guys to find that freedom.